BioBalance HealthCast, episode 273, Bariatric Surgery for Body Image Issues. BioBalance HealthCast features conversations about positive aging. Your hosts are Dr. Kathy Maupin, Medical Director of BioBalance Health and a leading expert in treating symptoms of aging, and Brett Newcomb, a licensed professional counsel. When we prepare a podcast, we do research and we have conversations and we plan what we think we want to communicate. And sometimes it's difficult to find entry and exit points to (laughs) to say, okay, this encapsulates what we want to talk about. Uh, Today's podcast is a good example of that. We started talking about treatments that uh, people receive, people that come to your office and say, what can I do about this? What can I do about that? Mm -hmm. Who are people who have had obesity problems in their lives and severe weight problems in their lives and who have uh, experienced uh, what are called gastric bypass surgeries and then afterwards they have some cosmetic issues they have some joint and skeletal pain issues they have some uh, appearance but they would have had that issues. anyway because those are left over from their obesity days e- exactly the, but, the joint so, pain so we decided where do we back up to a beginning <laughs> mm-hmm. to make sense out of this conversation mm-hmm. and so we thought we would begin a little bit with a discussion about bariatric surgery and morbid obesity mm-hmm. and, and people that suffer from that and you know uh, there's there's a range of treatment recommendations for people that are obese Mm -hmm. but you you get to a a level that's classified as morbidly obese for which you then become a candidate for bariatric surgery and basically the two levels of that as I understand it Mm -hmm. you you can help me (laughs) Uh, if you have a BMI in excess of 40 and you don't have any other health issues then you're a candidate for bariatric mm-hmm. surgery. Right. And if you have a BMI in excess of 30, but you have some other issues such as diabetes. Diabetes or heart disease or high cholesterol. Or, then, I you're, mean, then you're a candidate at that point. Things that most people who are mm-hmm. obese actually have, even right. hypertension. Right. So, so it's easy to fulfill that recommendation. So it's really rare to get to above 40 with no other issue. Right, and it's really... And at over 30, usually something's happening, mm-hmm. you know, so so you can almost always fulfill that requirement if you are over 30 BMI. And it's a life-threatening condition. Yes, and so insurance it p- covers it, if you have insurance. Uh, I remember my wife was a teacher at a school district that self-insured, mm-hmm. and they had a number of school teachers in their uh, total staff in the district who suffered from obesity issues mm-hmm. and were candidates for bariatric surgeries, which are pretty expensive. And mm-hmm. uh, and there was a big discussion as they created their uh, insurance pool outline. You know, what will we cover? What will we not cover? Whether or not we should cover this because of the cost. Most insurances haven't covered obesity surgery. Yeah. Until recently. Until recently. And now they have because they realize the people who have obesity have all of these very expensive illnesses. Right. Illnesses that are chronic, lifetime. They have to take care of them the whole time. So when they look at obesity, they instead of just seeing, oh, a cosmetic problem, they see a medical problem. And, and finally, I mean, I think it's been a long time coming, obesity surgery and obesity treatments like medications right. Right. are now being embraced and being paid for. So, Because, again, we're looking more holistically at what are the potential costs through your lifetime of illnesses versus what's the cost of a given procedure that could help you avoid those. And they're also looking at the cause of obesity. Obesity can be psychological, Mm -hmm. but it also can be genetic. Mm -hmm. I mean, there, there are genetic tests for people who tell, tell me that that person never feels full. I mean that you're born with that. You can't do anything about that. If you never, to identify that. If anybody, I mean, most people in the U S have never been hungry, but if you have done a, you have, been involved in some type of diet or fast, you know what hunger feels like. These folks never feel full. They are always hungry. Now that's that's like pain. It's almost like chronic pain. So you have to get you have to think this is a real problem. If I was hungry all the time, I'm I don't think I could refrain from eating. Well there's a condition called a ventromedial hypothalamic lesion. <laughs> Say that three times. No <laughs> I don't know that I can't. That 
interrupts the ability, your body's uh, sensor measuring process by which it says you're full. Mm -hmm. And so they feel hungry all the time and they don't know when to stop eating. So that's a brain lesion. And they, it's a brain lesion. Uh, you could have a stroke anywhere. You, it could exactly. be there. It could be or there. You, could have, you could have a lack of that development as a child. And societally... There are all these damaging perceptions about you don't have any self-discipline, you don't have any strength of will, you're a slob. You it makes it a personality issue instead of a medical issue. So finally, medical condition, yes. they have brought it back to medical. Hopefully. And, and it is psychological, but that doesn't mean it's personality. Right. It's psychological because once you are at a certain girth, then you have to feed that girth. So then... Even if the cause of it, well, and then, and then was there are there. psychological issues. You get you get a habituation effect. Uh, comfort foods. We were talking before mm -hmm. we prepared this about it. everybody has comfort foods. When you're really upset, when you're depressed, when you feel bad, when you don't have any energy, when you have no love, you, you crave eat chocolate. certain things. Yes. When you want love, you eat well, chocolate. And, so you that know, they know what the comfort about it going foods are. All the way back to the oral stage of development, mm -hmm. when whenever you felt any imbalancing emotion, somebody put food in your mouth. And you learn to eat to make yourself feel better. Mm -hmm. uh, a patterning. There are those among us who still flirt with that behavior mm -hmm. throughout our lifetimes. You know, if I'm not feeling really good, I crave I eat ice chocolate. Cream. Or, chocolate, ice cream. Yeah. My wife eats salt like chips. And mm -hmm. you were telling me yesterday there's a crunch factor that. There's, yeah, anything that you crunch. Uh -huh. Like liquid liquid diets usually fail because because you get so depressed on a liquid diet because your serotonin drops. That hormone that makes you feel happy or not depressed, how you, it increases when you crunch. So if you're crunching potato chips, you're making yourself happy. I wonder if that's why some people crunch ice. Mm, ice is a little different. Ice can be a lack of a mineral. Hmm. So, and we, we we have names for it, and I can't recall an ice crunching name right now, but, but it actually is. is what I would call it. Yeah, well, some people do it psycho because it's psychological, <laughs> no, and I, some people do it because they really need that mineral. Right. But crunching, but it may come into play there, too, because crunching does increase your serotonin. Well, let's run through some of what we know uh, just informationally about bariatric surgeries. There, there are several different types. Mm -hmm. There's one called a gastric sleeve where mm -hmm. they put a band around your stomach, and they can control by the amount of fluid they put in this package. It's like, yeah, it's like a donut. Uh they can restrict, constrict, or release the stomach so that you can uh, control the amount of volume that the stomach will contain. All of these surgeries have to do with decreasing the amount of food you can eat at one time. Okay, right. so, so... You have to eat less more often. Because it makes you sick, literally sick, to eat too much. Mm -hmm. So the whole process isn't fixing the... Fixing the brain problem that causes, or fixing the psychological problem that causes, or anything else. It's making you so uncomfortable when you eat too much. But, but you still have to do the other counseling and training and restructuring behaviors. Well, because I mean, you'd be miserable if you were used to feeling, you know, of getting a lot of calories and then you go down to very little then it's like you're starving, even though all it is 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 a negative reinforcement. You feel sick when you eat too much. Working as a therapist <clears throat> over the years, I had a number of clients who had experienced bariatric surgery mm -hmm. and, and were struggling with the after effects of it. Mm -hmm. uh, the fact that they had to take a certain kind of vitamin because their body wouldn't digest normal vitamins, but mm -hmm. you need vitamins. They couldn't absorb it because it, it usually they have had that obliterated by having their stomach made so small or, or their small intestine right. made shorter. Right. Uh, the fact that, uh, I mean, one particular client said, I can't eat boiled eggs. I hate them, and that's a big part of my diet right now is what I'm allowed mm -hmm. or required to eat. And so I'm really in a bind because what I'm angry about is uh, whatever, but as a result of that, the way I take care of that anger is I eat this comfort food. And I, and so we talked about you're eating, you're angry, you know, the classic mm -hmm. psychotherapy right. jargon. Mm -hmm. uh, but it was a real <clears throat> struggle for this individual uh, to maintain the weight loss. A lot of individuals who have that surgery, who lose a dramatic amount of weight, begin to put it back on. And if they don't learn to reframe their thinking mm -hmm. and retrain their mm -hmm. habits, 
they come back and they they've blown through the surgery. the The gastric band is one of the better uh, types because you can't blow that out. But if you have your stomach stapled, mm -hmm. or if you have uh, a portion of your stomach surgically removed, mm -hmm. you can stretch the existing stomach that you use back out to the point that you can contain that volume of food again. And some of these people do that. People are very adaptable. Oh. You can, everything that medicine tries to do, oftentimes your body, I mean, the more you can adapt, the better genetically you are. So here we are, we have a problem. We've been given something to stop our problem. We adapt around it. We drink milkshakes or we- or Sabotage. We, yeah, we sabotage ourselves, you yeah. know, or we get up in the middle of the night to eat because that adds well, and calories. Then, and then there are issues <clears throat> uh, for after you've had the surgery, mm -hmm. things, and they tell you this ahead of time, but you don't absorb it because all you're thinking about is, I want to live. And this will help me live. And I want. And, and I, I want to be thin. <laughs> and but like the dumping syndrome. Mm -hmm. You know, that's huge. When you eat, almost immediately you have to void your bowels. Yeah, uh, it, it dumps and, your food instead of letting it go slowly into your small intestine, like mm -hmm. it does for people without this surgery. It just dumps it into the small intestine, which stimulates a bowel movement. I mean, and diarrhea. And diarrhea. And diarrhea so is it's a common problem to yeah. have diarrhea after this. We're not trying to tell you not to do this. We just think your expectations should be informed. Informed because then it's more likely that you'll remember you were told this and say, yes, I was told this and it's mm -hmm. worth it. Mm -hmm. Because we forget what we were like before. And another chronic issue, not a consistent, not a universal, but the, de the development of dental problems because of reflux and because of vomiting. Yeah. And I mean, people that have bariatric surgeries often have that as an issue. Because afterwards. they eat too fast or they eat too much or they eat or, or they drink a soda. You can't have sodas anymore. Or alcohol. Or alcohol because the sodas have the bubbles and the bubbles cause you to Carbonated reflux. Carbonated dishes. You right. were even saying fizzy foods. Any, yeah, fizzy anything. Anything that causes bubbling up makes you very uncomfortable and can cause you to vomit. Is that a, a, a gas yeah, yeah. issue in the system? Yes, it produces gas in the way your in the stomach, stomach deals with mm -hmm. it. Uh, difficulty swallowing, hair loss. And the hair loss is often from nutritional deficiencies because of the changes you have to make in your diet and, and the limit of food that you can take followed by the rapid dumping syndrome. So right. your so body you, isn't absorbing the, the way it's used to the absorb. The vitamins and protein that you need for hair. Yeah. But if you... but. You know, the surgeons that do this do give you information about what you should eat and how you should how, the vitamins that you should take. Mm -hmm. And those should, if you follow that, you should be able to not lose your hair. Now, my clients as a group, and there were several of them, uh, consistently complained about not being able to eat spicy foods anymore. Right. And some of them really, really loved spicy flavors. Mm -hmm. uh, and now they can't have them, and their perception is they can't have them for the rest of their life. And they're, again, frustrated and angry about that. You know, it's kind of like, be, be careful but what you ask for, is, you may get it. But living is much more important than eating it spicy is. foods. And many of us don't eat spicy that. foods because it, it hurts us, gives well, us heartburn. I think I have more burn. sympathy with those people. Than I know you do. <laughs> so, I mean, I like spicy foods. It just isn't good for me. I mean, mm -hmm. they just, you know, I get too much acid. So I understand I can't eat those, so I eat something else. Now, a, a beneficial outcome that doesn't last, but for a while at least is a beneficial outcome of these surgeries, is you somehow develop a more expansive form uh, of uh, stomach bacteria, right. uh, digestive bacteria. Mm -hmm. uh, people that have real obesity problems, one of the contributing nuance issues for them is that they they have less varietal uh, bacteria? Uh, right, you need. There's a whole stomach. world living inside your intestines, and you need those bacteria in your intestines. And people who they found that people who are obese have just a few types of bacteria. The right. rest don't live there for some reason, and they don't know why. They don't know why. But they were trying to figure out why the surgeries for obesity caused so much weight loss so fast it was out of proportion with the calories that were being limited so they went in they went to the bacteria and they figured out that all of a sudden there were many types of bacteria there that weren't there before
And that was the reason these patients were losing more, more weight than they should have by just limitation of the food. Mm -hmm. So if you eat properly and if you stay thin, oftentimes you will keep that variety of bacteria if you take probiotics. Right. Uh, but oftentimes people will gain their weight back when their bacteria variety goes down again. And that does happen. So part of what we're saying is you have to be smart and informed and disciplined even after you have this magical weight loss. It's life-saving. I mean, it can keep you from having diabetes the rest of your life. It can keep you from having heart disease. It can, I mean, it can make an unbelievable change in, in, your, in your health and in your life, but it is a drastic answer I had a client to the question. Of whom I am so inordinately proud. This woman worked so hard after having bariatric surgery and suffering through all those adaptations and putting a lot of the weight back on mm -hmm. and then taking a lot of it back off. When, when I first met her and she first came to the office, she literally struggled, phys physical agony, to walk from her car to my office. and That, that wasn't a big walk. No, <laughs> 50, 30 yards. Now she runs marathons. I know. And that's she's lost awesome, that weight and it? she's kept it off. And, and hooray for her. I, I just am so proud of her and so uh, happy for her that her life has changed. Mm -hmm. But not everyone can do that. And, mm -hmm. and part of the, the, the challenge is the damage that's been done over a lifetime of obesity to your structural system. To your knees and your hips and your feet and the joints and the ankles. I, if you think like an architect oh or like an engineer. Talk about stress load and weight load. My my knee is the same same size and and structure as the knee of somebody who weighs 250 or 300 pounds. So my knee is holding up 135 pounds. Their knees holding up twice that much. Three, four hundred pounds. So just structurally, four years, four years structurally, yeah. that damages joint by gravity and by pressure. And, and the more weight you have, the worse the joints get. And then your gait changes, and that, and that rubs your joint down. And then your hips go. And, I mean, seriously, it is, it is one joint at a time because of weighing too much. But now you can have those replaced. You know, right. life, life living is expensive. <laughs> it's better than being dead, and <laughs> it's better than suffering. And you being have in options. Pain a lot. I mean, like, and I'm not in contact with this woman anymore, so I don't know if she's had any joint replacement surgeries. Mm -hmm. uh, but she now runs marathons and has lost that weight, and is an emotional support for a lot of people with with weight issues. And, and weight issues are a spectrum. It's not like okay, you're skinny or you're morbidly obese. Mm -hmm. I mean, there's, there's a whole range. And many of us struggle with that. Mm -hmm. And so yeah. uh, if you live <laughs> to get this surgery and it changes your life and it creates a window of opportunities for you, there are continuing levels of intervention that you must make and changes that you must make to your diet, to your exercise pattern. You need medical support. You need psychological support. You need emotional support. You need mm -hmm. disciplined thinking based on information about what works. And, and so it's hard to people change. come to your office and say, help me because I'm in this place. Mm -hmm. And there are things that you can do that you can help in terms mm -hmm. of nutrition, in terms of I mean, uh, you don't do this, but we were talking about the bacterial thing. Uh, mm -hmm. One of the things that they can do is a, a fecal transplant to put new bacteria in. I really don't want to think about that. but that's Well, nobody does, do. but it, <laughs> if it helps you survive and it helps right. you live a better life, then it's then an option. That, that seems to be an easy there answer. There <laughs> are procedures that you can find and doctors that you can find to help you. Where you become helpful mm -hmm. is in the next level of survival. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and we're going to do a secondary podcast that talks about that. that the issues, for instance, insurance will pay for the surgery, for the bariatric surgery. What it won't pay for is the adjustments to your skin afterwards. Because you have a, a, and so you have these huge skin, skin flaps right. that were filled with the obesity, and now that that's gone, those are just there. And, they're there and they're hanging, and you have and to so, dress around them and walk around them and work around them, and they're really different. And so you're you're subject to <laughs> it makes it very hard to a dress. whole new level of negative attention 
mm -hmm. that you thought you'd get rid of if you lost your weight. And so not, and you can have it. You can have it fixed with plastic surgery. You can, but it's expensive and yes, insurance and it's typically not covered. That's not covered by insurance. And you know, you can get the knee replacement or the hip replacement, but you still are going to have to have the skin adjustments made. I want to uh, add one more thing to this that, okay. that you and I hadn't really talked about, but I just I was just thinking about that is that many of my patients have um, come to me after bariatric surgery, right? So many of them have already gone through this. They've already, I asked that question on my questionnaire because um, I want to make sure their nutrition is right. I want to make sure that they are able to keep their weight off. But also, once you've had, bari when you, before bariatric surgery, fat makes estrogen and not yeah. the good kind. Right. And so that causes your body to be, to bind up its testosterone and decrease the level of active testosterone. So, I have to look at that when they decrease their body fat. Of course, that gets better, but sometimes they don't all, re all recover. So that's one of the reasons they still feel tired. Their testosterone is still low and over time has gotten lower just like everybody else's. So they and they need to build some muscle because they've been so overwhelmed with fat that they haven't been moving around. And so, so <clears throat> testosterone helps them build muscle, and then the lo the fact that they lost the fat decreases their estrogen levels, their bad estrogen, not the good one. So that so we're making some progress with them. They feel better about their body because they make some muscle to hold up some of this skin. Yes, but it doesn't take the place of plastic surgery. Well. And I remember conversations with women who had had the surgery, and, and I haven't had any patients that were men. All of my experience mm -hmm. has been with women. Uh, but even the fear of the surgery, once they've made the decision to have it, because it's really hard. Uh, most hospitals don't have scales that will weigh them accurately. Nothing over 300 pounds. And so they have Usually. to have special, the special units that are dedicated to this mm -hmm. kind of surgery that have the special scales. Mm -hmm. But it's really hard for the anesthesiologist to calculate how much uh, anesthesia it takes to keep them under well, and to, to keep them not feeling the pain. These folks can't lie flat on their back either because the fat pushes and their lungs so up. The so the surgeries are dangerous surgery, in and of themselves. You're yeah. lying flat on your back. Yeah. I mean, there's so it's many things thing. to continue that are to con consider. It is a group effort. Usually, yeah. if you see a surgeon for this, You'll see the psychologist. Team. You'll see right. a team of dietitians of, of people who will prep you first Before and after. And after. Yeah. So, and that's what you're looking for. Right. That makes yeah, it very successful. It will save you your life. Right. But then you have to. Expectation is everything. You have to expect that you're going to have to do some things. There's no pie in the sky. There's no panacea. You have to work at this. And it's everybody's a long, got something. Journey. This just happens to be your burden this burden to carry and then that you're alive. So if you know someone who's suffering from any of these issues, please be more sensitive and be more supportive, be more encouraging. And if there is an opportunity, be more helpful. Thank, Thank you. you. Email your questions or comments to podcast at biobalancehealth.com. You can find the Biobalance HealthCast on iTunes and on YouTube. For more information about bioidentical hormone pellet therapy and other reverse aging solutions, visit biobalancehealth.com or call 314-993-0963. You can find Dr. Maupin on Twitter at Dr. Kathy Maupin and on Facebook at facebook.com slash biobalancehealth. Find Brett Newcomb at brettnewcomb.com.